Hi, my name is Mark Knudsen. I'm an application engineer working at Keysight Technologies on pathway simulation and design software. We offer a variety of different modeling and simulation tools that you can bring to bear to different applications that you're working on. And we're going to explore some of those today. I'm, I'm really excited uh, that you took the time to attend today. And uh, I want to, uh, it's just a great opportunity for me to give you a day in the life of insights that you can use and new modern innovative simulation tools um, to uh, in the academic realm for creating industry-ready students or as professionals working in industry. The, the way that we're going to showcase some of these different best practices and innovations in the tools that are, are available today, we're going to look at, we're going to showcase four different uh, examples. First, we're going to look at uh, kind of a smart device design flow that involves RF microwave boards, modules, ICs. We're going to look at um, innovations that are brought to bear there. We're going to look at um, needing high-speed digital board design and some of the modern specifications that get really, really tight to meet and the challenges that are involved in that. We're, the third one we're going to look at is uh, 5G system design. And uh, that's, you know, all you have to do is look in your pocket to see the innovation that's going on there. But we're going to take a deeper dive in how design tools can be brought to bear to, to um, help um, improve your, your shipping picture and the amount of money that you can save um, in terms of design. And we're going to look at um, the fourth one we're going to look at is an aerospace defense electronic warfare mission system example, looking at digital twin modeling and the advantages of using that. So thanks for, again for attending today. If you have any questions, feel free to enter those into the chat in the webinar forum here. Um, time permitting, we'll try to address those as best we can. And if there's any uh, that we don't, we'll definitely follow up after today's webinar. If you have, you can also, there's a considerable amount of uh, resources available in the resource section. So please look there for any deeper dive examples you want to examine on your own. Um, let's, let's, uh, let's dive into it. So, so let's take a look at design in the past and the not so distant past, actually. It was more of a straight line arrow process. You know, you would, um, basically measure your resistors, inductors, capacitors, your passive, maybe measure your active devices, your transistors, create, you know, create a model based upon that, extract a model based on that, build, put together a simulation uh, that you could, a circuit that you could simulate, um, run it, um, build a prototype based upon that and build a board and then measure it. And if things didn't work out okay, you could even, you know, do a little, uh, soldering at you know on the bench maybe a quarter wave match and and tweak it in into compliance or meet the very uh, the specification that you needed to meet and you're good everything was kind of done all in one engineer's head and um you know you didn't need bunches of teams and different systems to track it and you could you ship and everything was good complicated you're i'd say two things are really driving that higher and higher frequencies bandwidth data rates and then just to, to meet that need, just a lot more complexity. Um, this is an example of a popular smartphone board that's in one of your smartphones, probably in your pocket. All you got to do is lift, lift out your smartphone in your pocket to see this. But modern smartphones today are a great example of this. They, they are integrating a lot multi-band, multi-frequency, like 5G has FR1, sub, sub 6 gigahertz has 20, 20 something up to 52.6 gigahertz FR2 range. It has antennas, multi-band, uh, you know, it deals with different standards uh, coexisting and has antennas integrated on the board. Just a lot more complexity there um, to, to, keep, to keep an eye out for. So we're going to, you know, you have to have, obey power efficiency, you have to design for maximum battery life, um, you have to look at thermal issues, there's just a lot more going on there. So it's not a linear flow anymore. And the, um, the 
the knowledge of the specs and where you're at in the project is in, has to be in multiple teams' heads, and they have to use tools that work together efficiently. Keysight recently did a survey to a lot of our customers and different design communities out there, and we found some pretty interesting results. On the left-hand side there um, of the slide, you see 61% of the engineers were using at least five plus or more, you know, five or more design tools. And that's uh, very, you know, surprising, but yet not surprising. I mean, um, most engineers want to naturally use the best tool for the job. And, um, you know, so they, they have a variety of different tools and they uh, link them together. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not very practical. You know, it would be nice to have one tool cover everything, one vendor to cover everything, but practically speaking, it's it's not very easy to do it with just one tool, um, but what if um, what if we could provide you a way to shrink the amount of tools you use even by a little bit? Um, that's going to be less translation between tools, less in, um, data exchange issues. Um, that's going to go to your bottom line. To go along with that theme. Let's uh, let's look at it. What I call the virtual equation here. It's a it's a conundrum, um, but yet an opportunity for designers. Um, kind of like what I heard on a ubiquitous insurance commercial recently. Savings is always nice, right? And and if we had a virtual equation like here, and and you're going to see this on each of the four different examples that we're going to dive into. Um, let's just walk through it in a general fashion right now. So on the on the left hand side we have prediction. So if you could align your simulated and your measured results um, more precisely, that's going to affect your bottom line. If you could spend less time in the lab or your anechoic chamber, that's going to um, help you your bottom line. On the insight front, if you could remove risk, isolate problems sooner, do things before you even had hardware available, use the same compliance algorithms. You know that you're using in manufacturing on on the design tools that would uh, help on the insight that would help your bottom line and on the flow on the flow side if you could link design and measurements under a bigger tent use less tools uh, like was shown in the survey in the previous slide um, that's going to affect your bottom line so uh, all of this is going to uh, save engineering hours and costly respins Let's give you guys a very practical context of some different design flows. First up on the dance card, let's look at a very typical flow for RF microwave, high frequency printed circuit board design. And um, the diagram that I show here in the middle of the slide, I actually was lucky enough a customer just jotted it up on a whiteboard for me. This is how we do our PCB design for high frequency boards. And um, so, that, from a design engineer standpoint, it would be like the, the big red arrow. You move from left to right. And so you basically um, start out with, uh, on the left with requirement analysis. What are on the build? What are the specs that I need to meet? What are the parameters, the guard bands, you know, that I need to, to, to meet? And then you build up, as you move from left to right, you build up a more accurate model and um, that includes more accuracy. And then you move to the, the light green system design stage where you start building up models with maybe their parameter base, maybe they have measurement data that they're based upon, or you have other models lying around that, that are typical, and you start putting those together and see how things behave. Once you get to the point you have something good, you move to actually add in real physical models, um, passive models, um, nonlinear models uh, like a transistor, and then you start doing a bunch of simulations on that. And along the way, Keysight's uh, Pathways Design and Test Suite offers uh, a lot of different tools on the system side, on the uh, side wh where you start building up a more accurate circuit model where you need to do matching and synthesize matches or filters um, that meet the need and the spec requirements, the spectrum requirements, the power requirements. And you run a bunch of simulations. And you, then you get to the point where you can start building the physical board. Um, and you can uh, bring that in from schematic. They, they synchronize together, or you can bring it in and do it wholly in, in a layout environment, build that, map it to a substrate, and you can actually run EM simulations on that 
and get a very physical representation of how the the, the board's going to behave in in the real world in the lab, and then you build a prototype, the orange uh, the orange part of the diagram, and you basically are ready to you build the board, you fab fabricate it, and then you test it, and you look at verification DVT, design verification test, and then you see if you make certification. If you meet spec, you ship it. Um, sometimes you have to go back and, and do it again and again, and that's from a left to right perspective. A test engineer is going to go from the right to the left perspective, the big black arrow. So sometimes the test engineer and the design simulation engineer is going to lead and lag. You're not going to have data. Something's not going to be designed along the chain, and you're going to, it's going to disrupt your process. If you have a tool that um, can share data between them, whether it's using innate, innate tools like BenchView or Python that's integrated in a lot of the tools, you can exchange data and build very accurate models and, and slow down any disruptions you have on um, things leading and lagging against each other. Next on the dance card, let's take a quick look at system design flow. Depending upon if you're working in university research or in, act, in industry right now, designing a system, very likely you're going to get a different answer about what a system is depending upon who you ask. Just to illustrate what I consider the six critical roles in many of the complicated systems today, let me use this flow that I see with many of the customers that I work with. At the top of the chart is um, a light green box for the system engineer. They basically are taking system requirements and funneling them down to the different teams and constantly building models to look at the big picture where you're at meeting the requirements. As more accurate models are developed, they're funneled up, and the system engineer recalibrates. The dark green box for the RF microwave team, their job is critical to design the um, RF microwave um, front end of your transmitter or receiver ensure that you have the right signal, the right bandwidth, of the right power at the right time. The dark purple antenna team block denotes their critical responsibility, taking the signal, putting it into free space, and ensuring you don't violate spectral emissions. Then you go through a channel that's high loss, high dynamic delay behavior, and you have to have the baseband team clean things up. And that's comprised of the DSP team, light purple, and the light pink data processing team. Their job is to basically elevate the signal in a high noise environment. And the mechanical thermal engineer, last but not least, basically ensures that you're not rating too much power as heat. Keysight offers a variety of tools to help all of these different designers work. Let's take a look at our first um, uh, exa a practical example. It involves smart device design, whether it's phones or tablets. Um, basically, elegance is key to design in small spaces uh, to meet the, the hard needs of power, and battery life, and efficiency, and low latency that you have to do on these devices, and yet still be able to stream your cat videos very fast and in high quality. Let's the, the virtual equation that we highlighted earlier to smart device flow. So on the on the predictive side, um, on the predictive side, let's say that if you could, um, you basically want to align what you're seeing in simulation with what you measure in the lab. The more accurate you can build your models based on measured data or other or simulated models that you have on hand or from a data sheet, the better your prediction is going to be. And um, the second one with the insight, if, if you could have more uh, intuitive um, ability to link different technologies together, you know, one's based upon gas, one's based upon silicon, different uh, dimensions. If you could link those together and still predict what you're seeing in the lab, you know, in incorporate effects of packaging, um, power plane, different resonances, if you could, electrothermal effects, if you could see that with the insight, that would be powerful. And as I mentioned earlier on the flow side, if we could do more within one tent and still work with other tools more seamlessly than third-party tools, um, that would lower your flow footprint. And all of this is going to lead to saving you money. Um, so in the case of the smart, design, uh, smart, the smart uh, device design flow, we're going to look at this ability applied to a, a complex system with modules, ICs, packages, and and, and boards linked together. So is a, you'll, you'll notice first off, this is a very old 
tablet <laughs> because um, all the vendors out there are very uh, trade secret focused. They don't share things until way, way, way later. So actually a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you in this example is from a pretty mature tablet and um, that you probably recognize. But um, it, all of this is public information that was revealed by a company I'm going to show you coming up on um, uh, using x-ray. So it's amazing what you can see in an x-ray. But let's look at this from a standpoint of functionality of what you have to do in a, a complex smart device. So you need to meet data, location, personal connectivity, um, different standards for um, cellular communication, 4G in this case, or 5G is the latest. And you need to do it in a small form factor, and you need to um, do that with efficiency and low latency. So this kind of the, the uh, punchline of what, what was found in public um, searches of the, um, doing a, an x-ray of this tablet, um, it, it, a bunch of different vendors, 19, for example, 17 different radio standards were, were needed to be complied with for this device, uh, ni uh, 19 different IC um, then, uh, devices and packaging and, you know, from multiple vendors. So it's uh, not an easy task, and this is something that Pathway System Design Tool has been applied to uh, time and time again, and to get prediction, insight, lower, lower flow, and save money on design costs. This uh, company called Chipworks, uh, listed on the bottom of the slide, um, it's, uh, they do a lot of work in pattern, um, in patent infringement analysis and, and litigation, and uh, so this uh, particular mature tablet, we they X-rayed um, some of the, the one of the the main chips, uh, the functional RF chips in the tablet, and you can see a lot of interesting detail. The PA, where the PAs it switched between two different PAs, the switching control, the laminate usage uh, integration with the board and the bond wires, how that was put together, and if you look on the side, solder bumps were used to. to to uh, put it all together on a substrate and put it into the board. So smart mount is a is a technique and technology that uh, Pathway System Design Tool offers on our circuit and EM simulation end, which are kind of married together. And you might be thinking to yourself, what does that matter to me? Um, well, it matters a lot. Because um, if you, this is one of the uh, first example here. Let's say we had a fan in, fan out device, um, board where we had an SI transceiver, silicon transceiver, and um, connected on the fan in. And then we basically wanted to connect that to a gas filter chip and a, a totally different technology. What if we could make this simple, powerful, versatile, and scalable, meaning? You could uh, link all these together without having to do significant modification to mapping layers and changing the substrate. If we could just connect things graphically, put them together, uh, maybe even write some scripts to connect things. Um, and if we could make it scalable um, across different, um, different types of packages and ICs, that would be very powerful. A second example of smart mount is dealing with kind of a little bit what we looked at earlier in a, in a modern 4G, 5G device where you have different bands uh, of a power amplifier and you need to switch between those. So we have uh, two, they, it was for LTE Mimics, uh, and we had a switch that, that trans, transferred between the two of them. And all of this can be integrated in the smart mount, uh, different technologies put together to, to stitch together and efficiently create a model that you can run EM analysis and then even circuit analysis on it and do more what ifs um, with optimization and different uh, te techniques. So, so that was a quick look at our first application area. Let's shift gears and look at our second area, which involves high-speed digital boards. And I say exceeding the standards here. And there's a lot of standards you gotta contend with. Honestly, I blame you and I blame myself because we're all a bunch of uh, uh, bandwidth pushers. We want more and more data pushed faster and faster. We love our cat videos. So um, I, blame all, I blame all of us. That's why 
high-speed digital boards, whether it's Surdy's designs or memory designs. We're looking at a bunch of different uh, read and writes over uh, scenarios uh, involving clock and data rates. Um, a lot of different standards are involved there. If we apply the virtual equation to this, uh, we have on the prediction side, what if you could peg an eye diagram and a mask uh, in, in somewhere in the back plane where you can't even measure it? That would give you a lot of predictive ability and insight ability that you couldn't do just with measurement alone. And on the flow side, what if you could use the same compliance algorithms that you do in the in the manufacturing in the lab that you do in the on your simulation tools? That's going to affect your bottom line. Here's an example that uh, we've worked a lot with with uh, a Xilinx board. Uh, it's actually an application board that they provide to their customers, the KC105 FPGA board. And, and the reason that we like to use this in a lot of different uh, demonstrations of uh, high-speed digital uh, modeling versus measure is um, it, it has a lot of different standards built into this board. It's a very, in terms of real estate, it's a very, very big board, uh, nine, almost 9.3 by 5 inches, 16 layers of signal and power and ground planes and uh, lots of vias connecting all the layers. And it... Um, the the application board has you know PCI Express uh, Gen 3 4 I think 5 even now and it's got uh, HDMI USB um, type 3 it's got um, on the 30 side you know and it also has DDR4 memory design so a lot of different standards that you can play with SI Pro um, and we actually show correlation here between measured and uh, simulated results, um, which is very powerful. The, the measured is in blue, the red is the simulated results from SI Pro. So it's actually building, a, I'll show you it a little bit more in a sec, building an EM accurate parameterized model of the channel and trace selected and, and it's matching up against measured data. Now, one thing that we're gonna come back to is why is there such a, what if I could, have insight into why there's a suck out at 10 gigahertz on the S21. What what is causing that? That would be a tremendous amount of insight to help with our virtual equation and save us money. Um, there is uh, is is in all of the vias, all of the vertical lines that connect the different layers of the substrate and the different power and signal layers and ground layers. Um, those uh, there's uh, vias in there that actually is uh, resonating like antenna, basically that's causing uh, coupling and crosstalk between different lines, and it's causing that suck out at the at the 10 gigahertz um, in the ST1 performance of of the channel. A modern tool like SI Pro basically allows you to get from e a layout to EM accurate model to a circuit result uh, model representation of that EM model where you can do even more action on in less than 20 clicks. So it's all net driven. You basically import the layout. You, you can design it in uh, a key site pathway tool or it could be a third party tool. You directly import that layout. You select the nets that you wanna analyze and then you basically are guided you know, through um, you select the net that you want, and then you set up the frequency range you want um, and and the type of, it, it'll select the, the right EM uh, technology, whether it's FEM or method of moments to perform the analysis. And then you get S parameters and time, to, um, time domain reflectometry or reflection or transmission data, uh, single-ended mix mode. And, um, and the last bullet there basically will, will build you a, a hierarchical model, EM model, parameterized model that you can use in simulation. Why is that important? The next few slides are going to show you exactly why that's important. If we zoom in on the SI Pro results here from the Xilinx uh, board, you see that you automatically you get an analysis on the nets that you selected. You get all the S parameters that you want. And a high-speed digital engineer is going to look at that in terms of next and fext. Next is near-end crosstalk and far-end crosstalk that are automatically computed based upon the ETS parameters for the channel um, under those conditions. And um, the other thing I want to share here, 
we did this in our SI Pro Tool in about 23 minutes. And we did it also in a full-fledged FEM tool, and that took multiple hours. So to go 23 minutes versus multiple hours goes right to your bottom line on lowering um, your cost of design. If you take a look at a, a system shown here, this is actually in a car, a modern car. ECU stands for engine control unit. I show you this because it really showcases now, even in your car, it's a mobile data center. You got radar that you have to control and you're handling high stream data and doing a lot of computations. So you basically, it's not just your grandfather's DC power integrity anymore. It's switching speeds of uh, microwave level on the power integrity side. And that is the foundation um, that can affect your signal integrity being the goal but you have to basically accurately model emissions and immunity and crosstalk and all of the underlying power issues to make sure you can accurately model what's going across the channel. Just to contrast the old method of, of looking and detecting uh, worst case uh, situations in power integrity, it kind of failed to actually detect the worst case failures. The old method of doing it used um, step load and a transient spice type of simulation and you'd actually, with high-speed switching LDIDT, you get a false positive on the natural response based upon stuff from the data sheet. But what, you what we found in uh, an exhaustive study with the modern tools is that you need to do a forced response where you're looking at worst case with under over-voltage transmitter, receiver, bit error conditions, emissions like EMI and crosstalk, um, adverse environments. CI Pro, SI Pro work the same way. They allow you to basically uh, select nets, bring in a layout, select nets, do an, a, the analysis. In the case of power integrity, you, you define a voltage regulation module or the power source that's switching. Um, and then you also you define a, like a sink uh, where, where the IC, where the signal is going to travel to from the VRM. And then you can do analysis on you know, do I have too much inductance in there? I need to apply decoupling capacitance. I want to design for flat impedance across the frequency. That's going to give me the best chance for lowest resonance. And then I want to, you know, basically develop a schematic from that that I can use in simulation that's going to be an EM accurate signal integrity and power integrity model and even handle thermal effects. So why, why would you care? Um, to use, uh, uh, you know, an EM model in simulation. I, I'm, I've kind of glossed over that in, in the previous uh, slides. But the reason is, is that you can actually bring in uh, accurate models for different portions of your design, whether it's a board or interconnects or ball grid package, as shown in this slide here. And then you can apply a simulation tool uh, like channel simulation, which is not your grandfather's spice time domain simulation. It's doing time domain simulation, but it does it in a bit by bit fashion where it's doing superposition of different impulse responses of bits going through the channel and looking at rise and fall and superimposing all of those um, impulse responses together. Or it can do a statistical analysis. You could do two to the 16 bits or some crazy amount that would take forever to, to do on a traditional spice simulation or measure in the lab and you can get an accurate picture of like an eye diagram and a mask somewhere in the middle of your back plane and, and, and measure eye height, width, jitter, you know, those kind of me metrics. And did you, did you uh, violate your mask? The, the, the closing here is kind of twofold in regards to this example. Um, the, the measurement and the simulated results, this is a 4.8 gigabits per second example matched up very nicely using channel sim on a board uh, and then what we measured in the lab on the left uh, on an oscilloscope matched up very well. So the virtual equation is a piece there in terms of prediction insight, um, you know, helping to save money and because of a good correlation there. We have a model that we can do what ifs on. The last thing I hear is that um, you can you know, maybe you need to use a, a, a method of moments like a planar EM technology to model the board, but maybe like on this 3.1 type C USB connector, that's going to need an FEM tool. And 
pathway sy sy system design suite offers that all in one. You can use uh, the planar tool to model the board. You can use the um, three full 3D FEM tool to model the, the non-orthogonal um, type C connector. And then you can stitch them all together in schematic and run an, uh, like a channel sim analysis on this and get an eye. So let's move on to our third um, example, um, which involves 5G system design. So we're kind of moving from traditional EM and um, circuit with load, load and, and mismatch effects uh, running Kirchhoff's and all the, you know, current and different Ohm's law on it as a circuit tool, we're moving to a system analysis. Um, and what's the advantage of, of that is that uh, you can analyze um, accurately uh, a lot, you know, bigger dynamic scenarios. In 5G, um, it's just exploding, right? It has it definitely meets those requirements with high frequency, high complexity. You know, you have FR1, which is sub six gigahertz, and you have FR2, which is millimeter waves. Um, and that um, can go, I think like 28 gigahertz up to like 20 something gigahertz up to like 50, uh, 50 gigahertz, 50, 52.6 gigahertz. And um, you're gonna basically deal with millimeter wave issues. and um, you need to handle beam steering to, to bring about better lower latency and better reliability and deal with battery life. So it, but the, the deal with higher frequencies, higher complexity, like a millimeter wave, uh, if you stretch your hands out at 28 gigahertz, that's about 40 to 50 dB of loss that you have to contend with and come up with a better beam steering or find a better uh, base station to handset uh, linkage to, to have the best uh, connection and the best battery efficiency use of that connection. So 5G is a very dynamic space to apply the virtual equation of prediction, insight, uh, lower flow, uh, trying to save money. So let's, here's an example of why you'd want to use a system tool to model a dynamic system like a 5G system and not sacrifice but actually bring in the accuracy of circuit level models and measured models and uh, into the picture. If we start at the bottom left, we have a full frequency domain circuit environment that models your RF front end uh, system architecture and even a phase array. If you had a, a phase array on there, an antenna, we can, we can integrate that all together. So you have your amplifier stages, your filtering stages, your up down conversion stations, mixers, couplers, you can model all that and um, bring in linear models like S parameters or active models like X parameters and even full FEM element patterns from an uh, FEM tool, uh, like an FEM uh, EM tool. At the second level, the advantage of uh, is you have a dynamic behavior that's modeled purely in the time domain denoted by the number two if we move up to the next level. And you're basically the advantage there on generating the, you know, mod all different types of complex modulation, including 5G, of course. And then you can drag and drop the RF frequency model that you've developed on level one directly into this um, schematic environment. And Fourier is made happy by the translation between the frequency domain to the time domain is done for you. And um, still preserve the accuracy of the model that you built at level one. So the advantage here is yes, you can generate the complex modulation schemes. You can look at the dynamic scenarios like a beam being steered. You can look at coexisting and interference of different standards operating at the same time. And uh, you can see the impact on the overall beam and, and bits in, bits out. You can even, like as shown as level three, see a receiver output from the VSA software or the tool itself will show you constellation and the beam of um, spectrum of different users and EVM. And as shown on the top right, you can even model like bits in bits out throughput of a 5G system, including like a handset that has four antennas with different polarized and uh, phase ray antennas patches embedded on the phone. You can see the impact of, of diversity throughput through the phone. Very powerful. On the frequency domain side, um, we start out with the, the first layer that I, we just looked at. Um, we we took different we modeled a 28 gigahertz transmitter and took different um, um, 
devices from different vendors, power amplifiers, mixers, filters, and brought in that data from the data sets or measured data, whatever the vendor provided. And then we can actually do analysis on that on any way that we, you know, through any path that we want from the LO back to the RF, RF through to the IF. Um, um, we can look at a lot of different paths and look at cascaded signal, noise, compression, different characteristics uh, through, through that system. And then we can look at the spectrum and I'll show that in a sec. But traditionally, a lot of uh, design in the past is done with spreadsheets, which are fine, but spreadsheets have a hard time modeling different mismatch effects and nonlinear effects. It's very hard and it's, it's hard to look at um, broadband. This, this tool can handle broadband signals, modulated signals going through a complicated uh, RF front end like a 5G is going to have. This is a look at the cascaded um, noise, cascaded gain, uh, channel power delivered, compression through our device, if you, our system, our front end on our 28 gigahertz transmitter. And if you look here, you have uh, one on the x-axis, this is one 14, which are the nodes on the schematic that go around the, uh, the uh, amplifier at the beginning of the, of, on the left side of the, the 28 gigahertz transmitter. These are all nodes. So you see the path that was followed through the device on the x-axis on the y-axis is all of those distant cascaded um, gain, noise, um, power um, computed for you automatically through the, through the path that you chose. The other thing that you can see is the other area that uh, the frequency domain system simulator can give you is an interesting deep dive into your spectrum. At any node in, the, in your schematic, you can get the spectrum output and you can do spurious analysis and click a marker or balloon marker in this case on any, any item in the spectrum and see the path that it came through and what's causing it, whether it's a harmonic or a, you know, bandwidth infringement, um, um, violating your spectral emissions mask or what's going on. It gives you a lot of didactic, uh, intuitive uh, insight into what's going on in the spectrum. The final look at um, kind of marrying them together. So if we go to the second level, which was a data flow time domain level, we could generate the modulation as we have in, in number one here. It could be 5G. This is just showing a simple QAM signal, but it could be a 5G signal. And then you even have beam steering. If you're doing a 5G, you could steer the beam theta phi different directions um, of, your, of, your, of your antennas. And then on number two, we basically bring in our steered beam and we uh, form the beam and then we modulate the signal. And then we, on the far uh, right hand part of um, the section two here, we have our RF link. And that is basically a sub-circuit that is all the work that we did on our 28 gigahertz transmitter that was all done in the frequency domain. All that's taken care of, translating from frequency domain to time domain. And then, then we can basically look at the output of our system, our RF front end blasted with a 5G signal under 5G different conditioning, uh, synchronization conditions, and look at like EVM compression and uh, EVM under different circumstances. So all this to say, if you wanted proof of why it's good to have a highly accurate predictive model, here it is in the form of an 8x8, 28 gigahertz rectangular array. We looked at bore sight and plus and minus 30 degrees off and see excellent results between what we simulated in the Pathwave tool and what we measured in our chamber. Another way to look at the advantages of having an accurate predictive what-if model and simulation that matches what you see measured in the chamber is shown here. Our eight gigahertz harmonic that we simulate um, is violating, that's the dark blue trace, is violating our spectral emissions mass that we need to abide by. And if we go in and change a bandpass filter setting, we see that we can pass a mask. Now we save tons of hours of engineering trial and error time in the chamber. The area that I want to take a look at is aerospace defense. Um, um, basic and electric electronic warfare missions basically when you're performing in battle you have to be ready to go so um saving money is definitely important once you put something together but when you're on the battlefield you want it to work um but definitely when you develop the tools that are going into the battlefield you want to apply the virtual equation 
um, prediction, insight, increasing those, and lowering um, the amount of tools and exchanges of data and translation, measure data, and simula other simulation tools, third-party tools. If you can lower that flow, you're going to save money when you develop these, these, um, these systems. Model-based engineering has been around for a, a long time. It's been a new term coined. Um, actually, the, the latest term is called digital twin. But what it means is basically building a model that accurately predicts what you can measure based upon a variety of sources, whether it's measure data or models uh, like compact models for a transistor or uh, an EM models of an antenna or different models that you want to bring in that are maybe coded in, in um, MATLAB or something like that. You can bring that in or circuit level model, you can bring that in. This, the last example I want to show you is we have a, a beamformer that we worked on. We partnered with Analog Devices and um, at, at an IEEE event. And um, this uh, 8R1000 was a beamformer. It has four different transmitters and four different receivers. And um, it, it also was used in conjunction with another part, which is a TR module switch, ADTR1107. But uh, the thing I want to focus on today is that the 8R1000 beamformer chip, which is an IC beamformer chip, was accurately built as a model using data from a data sheet. And, you know, to accurately predict the far field beam and behavior under like radar or, or uh, um, a wideband signal application, uh, modulated application or pulse application is, is very powerful. So this is what we're able to do. We're able to get a phi, a phi cut of the beam or a 3D rendering of a beam that accurately models what we measure in the lab uh, um, on this um, 8R1000 beam former chip. And here's how the model was, was. This picture is actually from the 8R1000 design sheet. And everything shaded in pink is the four different transmit receivers. And what we model in the pathway system design was built by a, a a grouping of different frequency domain models um, for the RF front end, filters, amplifiers, mixers, and then it was two different bands, uh, K, uh, KA and I think uh, X band, and basically we switch between the two different bands and, um, and a number of different gain and phase states. And, um, and the, this is also from the data sheet, different bias settings. So we were able to actually bring in frequency-dependent data, bias-dependent data. Um, this is showing an amplifier model in, the, in our simulation tool um, that shows this frequency bias-dependent data for gain, noise figure, compression, different um, match, um, that we could bring that in and actually from the data sheet, directly import that from the data sheet, um, import sys parameters. That's how it was done as the, the button shown at the top of the chart on the right, of the user interface on the right. And from that, we're able to basically represent uh, the beamformer, and then we could apply a chirp radar to that and actually see the, the blue output spectrum of this is the ideal chirp waveform, and the red is what goes through the uh, 8R1000 beamformer model and shows the actual, it's not going to be the perfect flat, um, uh, gain across that wide, wide band. So um, very, very powerful tool to be able to do that. So I hope you, you had some fun today taking a look at the virtual equation applied to four different examples through prediction, um, insight, if we can increase those and decrease when it's possible the amount of tools and exchange and loss translation of different data between different tools or different measurements. Um, if we can uh, in lower that flow footprint, we're going to save money on, on, on design, whether it's engineering hours in the lab or the anechoic chamber, or if it's um, reducing costly respins of a design. So for today, the, um, the, uh, just wanted to show you that uh, pathway system design tool plays in a variety of areas. On the system level, we looked at in our last example, on the component level, whether it's RC, um, RF microwave boards, modules, ICs, high-speed digitals, power electronics, or if it's at the physical level where we're doing accurate EM models and actually looking at thermal effects, and even we can characterize device models if you needed to, to use in your system model or your circuit model.
And of course, we can bring in uh, measure data. We're key sites, so of course we can do that. Um, the uh, don't have time to go into it today, but there's a number of different ways to connect all of the different um, pathway of design and simulation tools to actual instruments. Whether you're bringing in measure data like an S parameter file or an X parameter file, an active device, or if you want to source and sync actual measured timed modulated data in and out of a simulation, we can do that. Moving forward, let me encourage you that you are going to basically lead the charge to design the smart future. Everything's going to have smart attached onto it, whether it's on your wrist, in your car, um, in your fighter jet, or in space. You guys are going to lead that charge, and the tools we've shown you today are going to be a great addition to your tool belt and a lot more examples to follow up with to get you started. Our goal is to get Pathways design and simulation software suite tools into your university, into your research lab, um, and get students using it and, and even your commercial partners. The uh, Keysight University Education Support Program offers a wide ways to access the tools, different bundles shown here, and um, you get a lot of flexibility up to like 52 floating licenses, minimum yearly costs, you can get unlimited uh, licenses seemingly for professors and students, and um, you're going to get supported with hands-on um, labs and, um, and support every step of the way as, as you need it. Here's a quick look at some of the different design areas that we covered today, looking at our four examples, smart devices, high-speed digital boards, RF microwave, um, 5G systems, and aerospace defense types of systems. And I um, hope you enjoyed it. Time and um, hope you saw some um, aha moments and ways to get in, uh, use an agile and connected workflow and pathway systems designed to, to uh, go to bat against a number of different uh, complex, higher frequency challenges today. Thanks and have a have a great uh, great rest of your day. Okay, thank you, Mark, for that presentation. Very useful. Uh, that brings us to the question and answer session. My name is Mark Vergeisel, and I will help you uh, running the Q&A session for today. First one I see here, uh, we are building prototypes using commercial components instead of designing our own circuits. How can we model those systems? Uh, yeah, th thank you, Mark. Um, yes, uh, pathway system design has a, a wide variety of, of live libraries uh, that we work with vendors on and have uh, components that go with all of, you know, all the different vendors provide from companies that you know, such as X Microwave, Analog Devices, and Corvo, just to name a few. And you can use these libraries to build your system and then simulate overall performance, you know, just by building them up. And if you don't have those, you can use parameter-based components but you can definitely bring in uh, vendor com component models if you have them. Include even modulated signals in your um, system design before you even lay out a board or purchase any parts. So it's pretty pretty neat. Okay, and, that sounds uh, good. Yeah, and what's what's the next question? Uh, I have another one here on on ADS. Uh, this customer says if we are using ADS to build circuits. How can we simulate how these perform with real standards like, for example, 5G? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We, since we're Keysight, we make it very easy, easy to um, leverage industry standard uh, communication standards, including 5G, on the transmit side, the receive side, the handset side, the base station side. So we built in great connections between both the circuit and the simulation uh, simulation tool, the system simulation tool. You can use, if you're looking at it from the, the, the lens of uh, circuit design in the advanced design system software, ADS, you could use what's called the VTB or the verification test bench. And what that is is you're running everything from a, a circuit envelope simulation, circuit simulation, but you're basically behind the scenes, the tool is leveraging the Pathways system design tool in the background to generate uh, the 5G modulated signals and goes through your circuit, your DUT, and then it comes out the circuit and analyzes it with the same soft, the same algorithms that we use in our VSA software and our hardware in the lab 
it's analyzing those um, uplink and downlink 5G signals and getting using the same algorithm. So it's very, very uh, integrated, very smooth, and you're using the same algorithms. You can also, on an alternate kind of use model, you can export behavioral models that you design in ADS to the system tool. So if it's a frequency dependent model, like an amplifier, a mixer, an up converter, filter, you can bring that over into ADS and use it back in the, um, the circuit simulation design where it all came from the system design. So it's very back and forth oriented and allows you to have a lot of flexibility in your design. Whether you're a system designer or a circuit designer, we, we've got the solution for you. Okay, so that sounds like you compare it with the golden standard, which has been defined by some standards committee. Is that correct, Mark? That That's correct. In the case of 5G, we're using the latest 5G 3PP standard um, for the handset and the base station. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. So I have a next question here for you, Mark. Uh, with the COVID pandemic and any uh, many and many universities, I should say, going online, how can universities leverage simulation to be successful teaching remotely? Is that something you can comment on? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so definitely, with COVID and the pandemic hitting the world kind of at the same time and great measure. Um, we, we, we're actually well positioned with, with uh, the solutions that we have available through the uh, key, key site pathway university program. You can, with, you know, with more on, online teaching occurring uh, naturally through the pandemic, the design, access to design and simulation software is, is readily available. And you, you could even do very even advanced concepts you can teach them with labs 100% remotely. The students can be in their, their do you know, in their house or their parents' basement or wherever they're at. Our, our, our student license program through the university program also enables participating universities to get students up and running very quickly from, from a local PC or a, a workstation, and they have access to that to, uh, in a remote setting very easily. Okay. Good. Um, related to that, this attendee says, uh, we are currently, or no, our university is currently using Pathwave ADS today, uh, but the Pathwave system design, so the, what we used to call system view software, looks like it would be a great addition to our curriculum. How can we uh, get about learning more about adding system view to the, the, the software suite that they are using? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, yeah, first of all, thanks for seeing some value in a kind of different tool, the system tool. And uh, I hope I've shown you that they both work together, you know, very, very handily, very seamlessly. Um, yeah, to answer your question, um, the university program bundle um, includes what's called the Pathways System Design Tool Access. Uh, and then it's, it's actually in the same bundle as the Pathways Advanced System Design, which is the circuit the circuit, uh, enterprise circuit tool. So they, they're they both in the same bundle. It's very likely that your university, your school already has access to those. It's already supported. So you already have those under your fingers, at, at your fingertips, um, right under your nose, hopefully. And um, you can start ac accessing the software uh, immediately. If not, you know, definitely let us know. We'll reach out and we'll make sure that you have access to them. But they are in the same bundle. So you should have access to it. Yeah, and, and maybe I can add to that. I know that some of the older uh, donation agreements that we have with universities, uh, they were per, per product family. Uh, but the newer system that we've been using lately uh, is including, as Mark says, all the products that we have in our EDA portfolio. And actually, uh, for your usage, uh, for your uh, benefit, I should say, in the survey, we added a question. If you'd like to learn more about our un uh, university donation program, you can tick a box and someone will contact you uh, to get more details about that. Okay, Mark, another question. Uh, we use ADS in our labs. Is Pathwave Advanced Design System a new branding for ADS? Um, yeah, yes, it is. The Pathwave Design Software is an um, umbrella branding for our, all of our electronic design products, simulation products, inclu including Pathwave Advanced System Design, which was formerly known as ADS. So that's correct. Okay, good. 
Uh, then I, this customer says, I heard you speak about Python. We use Python quite a lot. Uh, can you explain a little bit on how it's linked to your design tools? Yes. So um, let, let me just take the case of, of ADS or the Python Advanced System Design, um, the circuit tool. It's, it's linked in actually very um, intuitively, very um, woven in, into the fabric of ADS. So whether you want to completely run Python remotely and generate data files to put into ADS or take ADS files out of, out of you know, simulation results out of ADS and put them into Python and do something and do it and kind of collaboratively handshake the, the data back and forth, you can do that. Um, and even a, an um, integrated uh, data environment called uh, Spider is built into to, um, ADS so you can right from the data display, see Python, um, Spider, see your data going back and forth. The, the, the to go and, and come back in is natively built into it. Um, so e even processing different files, uh, unique custom data files that you want to bring into ADS can be done through Python Pandas, which makes it really easy. So hopefully that gives you a little little example of that. If you want to dig in more to it, um, we'll, we'll make available to you in the resources, some some links to do full full labs on how to play with that more and, and get get your feet wet with that. Hopefully that helps. Okay, understood. Thanks. Okay, and maybe uh, the last question uh, to avoid we are running out of time. Uh, could you give me a, a, an example of this virtual cost equation that you mentioned in your presentation? Yes. Um, Thanks for asking that. It, uh, the, the center point of what I wanted to share with you today is the cost. And um, let me give you a, just a really concrete example. So if you're measuring EMI, EMC, and a lot of our customers uh, design for that, but they don't test it themselves, they send it out to a lab, and it costs thousands of dollars a day to do that. If you could shrink the amount of time that you're doing EMI, EMC testing on, on your system, on your circuit, on your board, on your antenna, um, if you could do that in um, much less time, you know, shrink five days to three days or five days to two days, you're going to literally save thousands of dollars. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. We have other, many, many other examples of cost savings in the lab, cost savings in the anechoic chamber, um, you know, saving people from soldering and unsoldering things. And uh, so just let us know if you want any more examples. Be happy to pr provide them. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Mark, uh, with that, let's conclude this session. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thanks again for joining us. If you want more of these seminars, please go to keysight.com slash find slash webinar series, and that's in one word. And for now, I wish you a great day, and uh, take care. Bye-bye.